I am Beverly Shogren and I taught chemistry at Owensboro High School since 1970. What I do now a lot of times is work with tutoring students for the ACT. Since you're getting ready to take the plan and it is a preparatory test for the ACT, I want to give you the same hints. The science test itself is not a science content test or a science knowledge test. It's a reasoning skills test. It's very, very different. It's a whole lot more like a Sherlock Holmes or a CSI show where you go into a crime scene and you are trying to find the clues that best help you answer the questions. Um, in not being a knowledge-based test, it doesn't matter whether you remember your biology, your earth-based science, your chemistry, or your physics. A lot of times good students have a bit of a problem with this because you're accustomed to really wanting to know the material before you take the test on it. That's normally the right way to approach it. But this is more like working crossword puzzles, Sudoku's, games. All right, let's do an example and see what I'm talking about. In this ACT question, the first thing to notice is that the overwhelming look of the question. There are lots of charts, lots of graphs, lots of words. Um, that is designed to make you feel overwhelmed and they do a good job of that. Good test writers would be able to take this material and write 40 or 50 questions on it, but they only wrote these six. Your job is not to try to learn this material. Your job is only to try to answer these six questions. More specifically, your answer key is just going to have four little bubbles with A, B, C, D, or F, G, H, J on them, and your job is to figure out which one of those bubbles to fill in. Looking at this first question, the idea becomes I have to really understand the questions and the answers well, not the material. It seems counterintuitive, but that's what you're trying to do. So you scan the question and then you really study the answers hard. This question says it deals with study one. When I look at the answers, it says S allotropes increase or decrease, and SO2 has some more choices. If I come over to figure one, I don't find the word allotrope. That doesn't really matter because I find the letter S four times. And what's the only thing I have to know about S? I only have to know whether it increases or decreases. All four of those S lines increase. So I get rid of two of the choices. My other answer column said SO2. When I find the SO2 line, it increases sharply, decreases slightly, increase then decrease. I just answered the question. I certainly don't know all this material. I definitely know this question. Your job is to understand the questions and the answers very thoroughly. You do not need to try to learn the material while you have this limited amount of time to cover those questions. Let's look at question 11. This says, according to study 1 and 2, and continues. Remember, we kind of scan the question. We look carefully at the answers. The answers in number 11 are white S, orange S, red S, brown S again. Now logic tells me if the answers are from study one, the question's probably from study two. Study two here has two charts, but they're labeled differently, Pele and Cert. I go back into my question to see if I can find a clue to help me. The word Pele is in the question, that tells me that that is the right chart to use for this question. If I read some more of the question, it says most similar to, reflectance is most similar to. Knowing what a reflectance is is not important to answering the question. 
Reflectance is how they're labeling their y-axis, and you do know how to read a y-axis. If, I, if my answer choices are one of these four lines and the line on the Pele graph, there's just one line, which one of these four lines is most similar to that line? It's brown S. Okay. Question 12. Um, we're in study three. It says 0.61 micrometers. Does it matter that I taught science and can say that that's micrometer and maybe you can and maybe you can't? It doesn't matter because it's written right there. Your job is to find the clues in the question that lets you match that information with what you need to answer. Point 61 is just slightly past the end of this particular graph. So that means they're just wanting to know do you understand that the way a graph is tending to go, it will continue to tend to go that way? They have a key showing you that the solid line is large plumes. That one would go across just about at 0.5. Small plume was the dotted line. That extension would go across at about 0.9. We're answering these questions with even with me talking about them quite a bit in under 15 or 20 seconds a piece and you normally have very close to one minute a piece on each question all right if you are ever working on a question for more than 30 seconds and nothing's clicking just put a question mark next to that one mark your lucky answer of the day and move on now, if you're working on it 30 seconds and you're making progress, keep going and finishing the question. But if you've spent 30 seconds on a question and you're getting nowhere, move on and come back to it later. The lucky answer of the day idea means whenever you take a standardized multiple choice test, and between now when you're 10th graders and when you graduate from high school or college, you'll take a lot of standardized multiple choice tests. Always, just that morning, pick a lucky letter of the morning and stick with it anytime you're going to answer a question. It will raise your composite score at least one point and sometimes two, and it's a super easy hint. Thinking back to that first question we just did, by the way, we answered them, most of those questions pretty quickly. Did you realize that the questions we were answering had to do with volcanoes erupting on moons on Jupiter? Most people don't, and it really doesn't make any difference. It is an interesting passage when you have time to read the whole thing, but during the ACT, during the plan, is not when you're trying to learn that extra bit of information. All right, so we open a new passage. We mentally think of it either as a new video game that you're trying to play, like on Xbox, or as a new crime scene that you've gone into, and you immediately start playing. You don't worry about trying to understand the material you're trying to understand each question. So question 14 says experiment one. I look at the answers next. The answers in here are all in seconds. Under experiment one, you have a simple table with two columns, seconds and volts. Whether you knew V stood for volts or not is not all that important because you're trying to match it. If the answers are all in seconds, my question's probably in volts. I come back looking in the question, and I can scan and find that there is a number, 7.6 volts. Science does tell me that my numbers need to be in good ascending or descending order, so that shows me where to put the 7.6. If I come over here, I see that my time should be between 0 and 12. The way they worded that in the answer choices was less than 12. Going on to question 15. We're on experiment 2. Again, the next thing, I, as soon as I know which chart or graph I'm looking at, the next thing I look at are my answers because they are the most important part of what you have to understand. My answers are in seconds. When I look back in the question, I have two numbers. I have 6 volts and 1.5 times 10 to the minus 6 Faradays. When I look up in table 2, 
My six volts is up there. But that's at the top of the column where seconds are. If my answers are in this column, my question has to be over here. That times 10 to the minus 6 Faraday's, the only part of that number I need to enter is the 1.5. And the 1.5 is higher than any number that was already listed in that chart. That tells me my answer is bigger than 8.3. Gets rid of two of them. That leaves me a little bit more decision making. I have to decide which one of those two answers greater than 8.3 makes more sense. So I really come back up and look. Is there a pattern I can see? If this goes from 0.1 to 0.3, that triples. 7 times 3 is 21. 0.3 to 0.6 doubles. 2.1 to 4.2 doubles. So now I look here, 1.2 to 1.5, it's just a little bit bigger. It certainly isn't double. 15 is almost double of eight. So I limit, eliminate it and pick 10.5. Next question. The main purpose of experiment three. Experiment three has one simple table. The purpose of this question is, do students understand experimental design? Experimental design has an independent and a dependent variable. They're what is normally at the top. Experiment one was about voltage and time. Experiment two was about capacitance and time. The main purpose of experiment three is how does resistance affect time? So I start reading my answers. Voltage affecting? No, I don't even have to finish reading that whole sentence. Capacitance affecting? No. Capacitance affecting? No. Resistance affecting time? I found the match. I found the clue. I found what I needed to be sure I've got that one right. Question 17. Based on figure one, we want to measure the voltage across the resistor only. My answer choices were diagrams, but these diagrams aren't labeled. Figure one that they referred me to is the same diagram, but with labeling. That labeling lets me see what a resistor is. It's this sawtooth line. The V over here is labeled as a voltmeter, and a meter is usually something that measures, so a voltmeter probably measures voltage. If I come over to these diagrams then and I'm focused on the resistor only, choice A has to be my right choice. All right. Question 18. The answers look horrible in that question. The answers look overwhelming because there are so many numbers in them. But we have to see what we're dealing with. Um, the key words are shortest amount of time. And when you're going through the questions, the kind of things you look for are, compares most similarly to is the greatest, is the least, shortest amount of time. That kind of word tells you what the focus for your question is. Experiment two and three, my answers have the F and the Greek omega in them. Table two has the F for Faraday's. Table three has the Greek omega for ohms. So those are all just saying the same things. They're saying I need to look at these two tables. If my focus is shortest amount of time in table two, the smallest number of seconds is also the smallest number of Faraday's. In table three, my smallest number of seconds is my smallest number of ohms. So out of this mess over here, what I'm looking for is the smallest set of numbers. Under Faraday's, my choices are 0.1 or 1.2. I get rid of the 1.2s. And under the omegas, my choices are 0.3 or 1.0. That choice F was my smallest set of numbers. One more. Within a question, within a passage, by the way, the questions are supposed to go in order from the easiest to the hardest. The passages are not necessarily in order from easiest to hardest, 
but within a passage, the questions are supposed to be from knowledge level through application through synthesis. So as you, as you go through a question, they may get a little more involved. Last question here. It's a wordy question, but it tells you they're going to write a hypothesis. So I try to read to figure out what the hypothesis is. I look at my answers. I have yes, yes, no, no. And I have experiment one twice and experiment two twice. So I know I'm going to have to make two decisions. Is the hypothesis they stated true or false? And which experiment supports whether that's correct? The hypothesis here is as capacitance increases, time increases. If you look at the amount of words I've underlined out of that whole passage, it's probably less than a fourth of them. And it helps you to focus on what it is you're trying to do. If it's capacitance and time, if I come over and look at my experiments, experiment two was about capacitance and time. Experiment one was about voltage and time. I can get rid of my two choices that say experiment one because whether that's correct or not, experiment one didn't do anything at all to support that conclusion. In experiment two, that hypothesis says as a capacitance increases, does the time increase? Yes, they do. So we're there. All right. There are two more hints I'd like to give you out of this other passage that I have here. One is to notice that even when the test writers put a particularly well done diagram on there, don't let yourself be distracted for it unless a question leads you back to it. This well done diagram is called figure one. This piece of equipment is called a bomb calorimeter. When I taught chemistry, I had a 30 minute lecture on this one piece of equipment. It's really fascinating. The next day we did a whole lab on bomb calorimeters. But during the ACT, during the plan is not when you want to be learning about bomb calorimeter. This piece of equipment is how you figure out how many calories are in a Big Mac or a Reese's cup or an apple or a banana. Um, but if you read through all the questions with this, they never ever referred you back to figure one. So however much time you spent studying that figure, you wasted it. There are three tables here, table one, table two, table three. The question writers did not refer to figure table three either. So in looking at this, and there was another whole page of questions, I never had to read that. I never had to refer to this figure. I never had to refer to that table. Let the questions tell you which tables and charts you need to spend time with, not, not how big the passage is. The other thing I want to talk about a little bit here is in table one, you'll notice that there are four columns instead of the usual two. Most of these other charts have one for the independent variable, one for the dependent variable. In this chart, you'll also notice that the numbers are not in good ascending or descending order. Even though the test writers want to slow you down, ethically they cannot just jumble the numbers up to be ornery. That's not ethical. They can't do that. Anytime you see a chart where the numbers are not in good science order, it's because your independent variable is in alphabetical order. I told you that this piece of equipment is how they figure out calories. This is four entries out of a diet book. It says how many calories are generated by one gram of bread, one gram of cheese, one gram of egg, or one gram of potato. If you buy a diet book, you want the food entries to be in alphabetical order because that's how you can find them. So over here you have two different ways of measuring your dependent variable. One is the actual temperature change and one is kilojoule, which is the science unit like we're used to saying calories when we're dealing with food. All right. The other thing that's different is you've got your constant in the table. And that's really unusual. Why would you put the same number in the table over and over and over again? 
that tells me as a test taker that that's going to be important for a question. Here's the question it's important for. We want increasing order of heat. And it says look in both table one and table two. Increasing order of heat from this column is 3, 6, 10, 17. Increasing order means increasing order no matter what order these numbers are written in. 3 is the smallest, 17 is the largest. If you translate that to the food, you have potato, egg, then bread, then cheese. So we find potato, egg, bread, cheese in order there. Potato, egg, bread, cheese in order there. Here they're backwards, so that one's wrong. This one, I don't know what they did with it. But we have the choice of whether to put sucrose at the beginning or sucrose there. When we look at sucrose, that's where we needed to know what the constant was in this table. To pick which one of these pieces of data we needed, we needed the same number of grams of the food. And sucrose, they had used a variety of numbers. So the one gram sample generates 16 kilojoules of heat. 16 is between 10 and 17. So then the sucrose needed to be between the bread and the cheese. I think those hints are probably what you need to help you do better on the uh, plan test because you need to remember it is a reasoning test, not a content test. You are to try to understand the questions and the answers very thoroughly. You do not need to understand the material. You let the question lead you to which part of the material, which chart, which graph, what, what you're looking for. Good luck.